I welcome you to my channel, subscribe and listen to my new stories every day. The clock on my desk flickers, glowing in the dim light of the office. It's past 8 p.m. The building is quiet, save for the faint hum of computers and the distant murmur of janitors wrapping up their rounds. I lean back, hands clasped behind my head, staring at the ceiling. She said she had another late meeting. I pull out my phone, hovering over her contact. I've never questioned her before. Why would I? Emily's career was as demanding as mine, if not more. But tonight, something gnaws at me. The past few months, she's been distant, distracted, even. The constant string of evening meetings, the hushed phone calls in the kitchen, the sudden trips to the office on weekends. I dial her number. No answer. I try again. Still nothing. Maybe she's in a meeting, I tell myself, trying to bury the growing knot in my stomach. But something's off. I slam my laptop shut, toss it into my bag, and head for the elevator. It feels impulsive, maybe even reckless, but I need to know. Ten minutes later, I'm speeding across the city, the cool night air rushing in through the cracked window. Emily's office is downtown. High rise. Glass walls that shimmer in the moonlight. I pull up to the building, park, and step out, the sound of my footsteps bouncing off the pavement. The security guard at the front desk looks up as I approach. Evening, I say, trying to sound casual. Here to see my wife. Emily Waters. She's working late tonight. The guard squints, recognizing me from previous visits. I haven't seen her come in this evening, he replies, flipping through a logbook. My heart skips a beat. Are you sure? She said she had a meeting tonight. He shrugs. Maybe she's in one of the upstairs rooms, but her name's not in the log for today. Want me to check again? I wave him off. No need. Thanks. I walk towards the elevator, pretending like I'm going to take it up, but instead, I veer into a shadowed corner of the lobby and pull out my phone. If she's not here, where the hell is she? I call one of her co-workers, Julie. She answers on the third ring, her voice groggy. What's up? Hey, sorry to call late. Do you know if Emily's still at the office? There's a pause on the other end. What? No, we didn't have anything scheduled tonight. We haven't had meetings all week. I gripped the phone tighter. Are you sure? She told me she had something important tonight. Julie sighs. Positive. I saw her leave around five. I assumed she was going home. My mind races. I mumble a thanks and hang up. The knot in my stomach tightens. Where is she? I dial Emily again. Still no answer. I run my fingers through my hair, pacing the lobby. This doesn't make sense. She wouldn't lie to me. Would she? The thought slams into me, hard and sudden. I shake it off, but it lingers, curling around my thoughts like smoke. I need answers. I storm out of the building, back into my car. I'm not even sure where to go, but my body moves on autopilot, driving through familiar streets, past restaurants and bars we used to frequent. My phone buzzes. A text. Emily, hey babe, running a bit late, meetings wrapping up. See you at home soon. XX. I slam on the brakes, pulling over to the side of the road. The message feels like a slap in the face. My hands shake as I stare at it, my blood boiling. She's lying to me. Right now. To my face. I take a deep breath and text her back, keeping it simple, no rush. See you when you're done. But my mind is already spinning. Betrayal, cold and sharp, gnaws at me. I've always trusted her. Always believed in the late night meetings, the work trips, the long hours. But now. Now I'm questioning everything. The plan forms in my mind before I even realize it. 
A slow, calculated revenge. I'll find out who he is. I'll catch them in the act. And when I do, I'll tear her life apart the way she's about to tear mine. I start the car again, driving aimlessly, waiting for her next move. There's no turning back now. This isn't just about her infidelity. This is about the lies, the deceit. She played me for a fool. But she won't get away with it. Not anymore. As I circle the block around our house, I catch sight of her car pulling into the driveway. She steps out, looking every bit the composed professional, unaware that her entire world is about to crumble. I sit there, gripping the steering wheel, watching. My pulse races, and I know it's only a matter of time before the trap I've set will close. And when it does, she'll never see it coming. I kill the engine and sit in the car, my eyes glued to Emily as she walks up the driveway. The porch light flickers on, casting long shadows against the house. She moves with the same ease, the same confidence I've always admired, no, loved. But now it feels like a mask, something I can't trust. Her phone is in her hand, and she's typing rapidly, completely unaware that I'm watching her. I take a deep breath and dial her again. My heart thuds in my chest as I see her stop mid-step, looking at the screen. She hesitates. She's deciding if she should answer. After a moment, she puts on her best cheery voice, the one that's so painfully familiar. Hey, babe, she says, too quickly. Just finished up at the office. I'll be inside in a sec. I lean back, trying to keep the edge out of my voice. Everything go okay with the meeting? Yeah, nothing too exciting, she says, her voice light and unbothered. Just the usual. Sorry it ran late. I glance at the clock on the dashboard. It's 9.30. I thought you'd be home earlier. Must have been a long meeting. She laughs, but it sounds strained. You know how it is. Sometimes things take longer than expected. I grind my teeth. She's lying to me again. But instead of confronting her now, I swallow my anger. Timing is everything. I can't let her know what I'm planning. No problem. I'll be inside soon. Just finishing up some emails in the car. Okay, she chirps, too cheerfully. See you in a bit. She hangs up, and I watch her walk inside the house. My knuckles are white as I grip the steering wheel, fighting the urge to go in there and demand answers. But I need proof. If I explode now, she'll just deny everything. I need something concrete. Something undeniable. I pull out my phone and start searching for private investigators. I've seen this kind of thing in movies, but now it's my life. Within minutes, I find someone reputable and text them, setting up a meeting for the next morning. I sit there for a few more minutes, letting the reality of what I'm about to do sink in. This isn't a hunch anymore. It's happening. She's betraying me, and soon I'll have all the evidence I need. When I finally walk inside, the house is eerily quiet. Emily is in the kitchen, pouring a glass of wine. She turns and smiles when she sees me, that same perfect smile that used to make my heart skip a beat. Now it feels like a blade twisting in my gut. Want some, she asks, holding up the bottle. I shake my head. No, thanks. Long day. I'm just going to head to bed. Her face flickers, just for a second, like she's relieved I'm not asking questions. Okay, Han, I'll be up in a bit. I nod and walk upstairs, my mind racing. I can't help but wonder how long she's been doing this. How many nights like this have there been? How many lies? Once in the bedroom, I sit on the edge of the bed, my mind swirling with plans. The private investigator will tail her. I'll get her phone records. I'll follow her if I have to. I'll find him. A knock on the door startles me. Emily's standing there, looking at me with a concerned expression. You okay? she asks softly. 
I force a smile. Yeah, just tired. She walks over and sits next to me, her hand resting on my shoulder. You've been so stressed lately. Everything okay at work? I almost laugh at the irony. I'm stressed because you're lying to me, I want to shout. But instead, I play along. Yeah, it's just been a lot to manage, I say, keeping my voice calm. We're in the middle of a big project. I'll be fine. She leans in and kisses my cheek, lingering for a moment. Let me know if you need anything, okay? I'm here for you. I nod, biting back the bitterness. The cruelty of her words is too much to bear. She has no idea that her entire world is about to come crashing down. I stand up, excusing myself to the bathroom. In the bathroom, I splash cold water on my face, staring at my reflection in the mirror. My heart pounds in my chest, and my hands tremble. It's not just anger, it's the overwhelming sense of betrayal that's eating me alive. I clench my fists and breathe deeply, reminding myself that I need to stay in control. This isn't just about catching her in a lie anymore. This is about retribution. When I return to the bedroom, Emily's already in bed, her back turned to me. I slip under the covers, careful not to touch her. I feel the distance between us like a chasm. I close my eyes and let my mind drift to the plan. Tomorrow, the real hunt begins. The next morning, I meet the private investigator in a coffee shop on the other side of town. His name is Derek, a middle-aged guy with graying hair and a permanent frown. He gets straight to the point. Look, if your wife's cheating, I'll find out, he says, sliding a folder across the table. I've been doing this a long time. I'll need access to her schedule, her social media accounts if possible, and any information you have on her routine. I nod, trying to keep my voice steady. She's been working late a lot. Lots of meetings that don't make sense. I don't have her passwords, but I can give you her usual routine. Derek scribbles down notes, then looks me in the eye. If there's another guy, we'll find him. I'll follow her for a week, maybe two. After that, we'll have answers. I thank him and leave the cafe, my stomach churning. The reality of what I've set in motion is starting to hit me. I've put my marriage, my life, in the hands of a stranger, and now all I can do is wait. That night, I watch Emily closely. Every movement, every word, every glance feels like a clue. She's distracted again, her phone constantly buzzing with texts. When I ask her who it is, she brushes it off. Just work stuff, she says with a shrug, not even looking up from the screen. I nod, pretending to believe her. But I know better. I keep my answers short, my demeanor cool. She doesn't notice the change. Or maybe she does and doesn't care. As the days pass, Derek sends updates. Emily's movements are erratic. She's not going to the office. She's meeting someone in a part of town we never visit. Each day, the evidence piles up, confirming my worst fears. On the sixth day, Derek sends me a photo. It's Emily, walking into a hotel with a man I've never seen before. They're laughing, close, too close for comfort. My phone buzzes with another message from Derek, want me to keep digging or is this enough? I stare at the photo, the image burning into my brain. I feel the rage boiling inside me, threatening to spill over. But I force myself to breathe, to stay calm. Not yet. This is just the beginning. The trap is set, and I'm going to let her walk right into it. I stare at the photo, the grainy image of Emily walking into that hotel burned into my mind. She's smiling, her arm brushing against the strangers as they move inside. It's like watching a film, but this time, I'm not just a spectator, I'm the fool, the betrayed. I can't tear my eyes away from the screen, the picture mocking me. The air in my office feels thick, suffocating, as I lean back in my chair, my thoughts a mess of anger, humiliation, and the coldest determination I've ever felt. I dial Derek's number, my hand trembling slightly. 
He answers on the second ring. Got your message. What's the call? I want more, I say, my voice flat, cold. I need more than just a photo. I want everything, texts, emails, whatever you can get your hands on. I want to know who this guy is, where they meet, how long it's been going on. Derek pauses, the silence stretching. Look, I get that you're pissed, but what's your end game here? Most guys want the proof and that's it. You, seem to be planning something bigger. My jaw tightens. I'm not just walking away from this. I want her to pay for what she's done. So yeah, keep digging. I'll pay whatever it costs. There's a long sigh on the other end. All right, but I'll warn you now, this kind of revenge. It's a slippery slope. I'm already on it, I say, before hanging up. I sit there, staring at the phone. Revenge has always felt like a distant concept, something that happened in movies or books. Now, it's my life. And I'm not backing down. That night, I lie next to Emily, listening to her even breathing, the soft rise and fall of her chest as she sleeps. She looks peaceful, oblivious to the storm brewing around her. I can't help but wonder how she does it, how she can betray me so completely, yet act like nothing is wrong. My mind races, replaying every late-night meeting, every vague excuse. How long has this been going on? How many times has she looked me in the eye and lied? I can't stay in bed. The walls feel like they're closing in, the weight of her deception too much to bear. I slip out of bed, careful not to wake her, and head downstairs to the kitchen. I pour myself a drink, the burn of the whiskey barely registering as I lean against the counter, staring into the darkness. My phone buzzes on the counter, snapping me out of my thoughts. It's Derek again, but this time, it's not just a message. Derek, got some texts. Thought you'd want to see. I tap the attachment, my heart pounding as the screen loads. It's a series of text messages between Emily and some guy named Ben. They're casual at first, flirty, nothing too alarming. But then, as I scroll, the tone shifts. The messages become more intimate, the kind of conversations a husband should have with his wife, not a stranger. Ben, last night was amazing. Can't stop thinking about you. Emily, same here. I can't wait until we can meet again. Maybe this weekend. I grip the phone tighter, my vision blurring at the edges. I scroll further, feeling the knife twist with each word. The lies. The deceit. Every single message is another punch to the gut. I toss the phone onto the counter, pacing the kitchen, my mind racing. I've been too passive, too patient. I've played the good husband, trusting, loyal. And for what? To be humiliated like this? I need to act. Now. The next morning, I leave before Emily wakes up. My plan is already forming, the gears in my mind turning relentlessly. I head to work, but my focus is elsewhere. I keep replaying the messages, the photo, the way she smiled when she thought no one was watching. There's no guilt, no remorse. Just lies stacked on top of lies. By the time I sit down at my desk, I've already decided what to do. The revenge won't be simple. It won't be quick. But it will be thorough. I've given her everything, and she's thrown it all away for some fling. She doesn't get to walk away from this unscathed. I spend the day making calls. First, I reach out to our financial planner, under the guise of a routine review. Emily and I have always shared everything, accounts, assets, investments. But now. I'm preparing to take it all. I set up meetings with my lawyer, laying the groundwork for a divorce that will leave her with nothing. But that's not enough. I also contact IT at my office, requesting help with tracking down anything suspicious in our home network. I tell them it's a cybersecurity concern. They agree to run diagnostics, and I know it's only a matter of time before I get more information, emails, browsing history, 
anything that can help me in court. I'm not just going to end this marriage. I'm going to ruin her life. Later that evening, I return home, the rage simmering just beneath the surface, but I keep it hidden. I need to play the part a little longer. Emily's in the kitchen, cooking dinner, humming softly to herself. It's surreal, watching her act like everything's normal. Hey, she says with a smile as I walk in. I thought I'd cook us something nice tonight. Thanks, I reply, keeping my tone casual, hiding the venom in my thoughts. Work was crazy. Nice to come home to this. She beams, and for a moment, I almost hate her more for it. How can she pretend so easily? How can she stand there, cooking dinner for me, when I know what she's doing behind my back? I sit down at the table, watching her move around the kitchen. She talks about her day, about work, but I barely hear her. I'm focused on the plan, on the moment when she'll realize I know everything. As she sets the plates down and we start eating, I glance at her phone on the counter. It's face down, but I know what's inside. I know who she's texting, who she's thinking about. How was work today? I ask, my voice steady, keeping up the charade. Busy, she says with a shrug. Another late meeting tomorrow night. The lie slips out so smoothly, without hesitation, and it takes everything in me not to snap right then and there. Instead, I nod, swallowing down the bile rising in my throat. After dinner, she excuses herself to go upstairs, claiming she needs to catch up on some emails. I watch her go, my fists clenched under the table. My phone buzzes again. It's Derek. Derek, got the full itinerary for the weekend. Hotel reservation confirmed. Want me to follow? I stare at the message, my pulse quickening. She's planning to meet him again. This weekend. Another lie, another betrayal. I close my eyes, my thoughts racing. No, I don't need Derek to follow her anymore. I've got everything I need. Now, it's my turn to make the next move. The night is quiet, but my mind is not. I lie in bed, my heart pounding as I think about what comes next. Emily sleeps beside me, unaware of the storm that's about to hit. I've been patient, careful, but now it's time to strike. I turn off the light and close my eyes, knowing that in a few days, everything will change. She has no idea what's coming. And when she realizes, it'll be too late. The life she's built, the lies she's told, it's all about to come crashing down. And I'll be there to watch it happen. Saturday morning arrives with an unsettling calm. I wake up early, my mind sharp, focused. The plan I've spent days weaving is ready to unfold. Emily is still asleep, curled up on her side, unaware that today will be her undoing. I glance at her, feeling the cold rage simmer beneath my skin. I head downstairs, making coffee, my fingers steady as I pour the dark liquid into my cup. I check my phone, Derek has already sent the final details. Emily's hotel reservation is confirmed for tonight. Ben will meet her there. She'll tell me she's working late, like she always does. But tonight, everything will be different. I glance at the clock. 10 a.m. I've got hours to set everything in motion. By noon, I've already made the arrangements. The divorce papers are ready, sitting in an envelope on my desk, along with copies of her texts with Ben, the photos, the hotel confirmation. I've left no stone unturned. But this isn't just about the divorce. That would be too easy. I want her to feel what I've felt, the betrayal, the loss, the humiliation. She'll lose everything, and she won't even see it coming. Emily wakes up late, coming down to the kitchen around eleven, her hair still damp from the shower. She gives me a quick kiss on the cheek, all smiles and warmth, as if we're just another normal couple on a lazy Saturday. I've got some errands to run later, she says casually, pouring herself some coffee. And I'll probably be working late again tonight. Another project deadline. I nod, playing along. 
Of course. Whatever you need. Inside, I'm screaming. Tonight's the night, Emily. I watch her move around the house, packing a bag with what she says are work papers, but I know better. She's heading to meet Ben, probably planning some romantic evening at the hotel while I sit at home, oblivious. Except I'm not oblivious anymore. I've got every detail. The day moves in slow motion. I pretend to work, all the while keeping an eye on the clock. By 6 p.m., she's getting ready to leave. I stand in the hallway, watching her fix her makeup, her reflection smiling at me in the mirror. You look nice, I say, forcing a smile. Thanks, babe, she replies, her tone sweet, affectionate. I'll be back late, so don't wait up, okay? I nod, watching her walk out the door. I listen to the sound of her car engine fading into the distance, and then I spring into action. By the time I arrive at the hotel, it's dark. The streetlights cast long shadows over the pavement as I park across the street. I watch the entrance, my heart pounding in my chest. I've thought of this moment a thousand times, and now it's here. I'm not just angry anymore, I'm cold, calculating. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I wait until I see her car pull into the parking lot. She steps out, dressed to impress, high heels, red lipstick, the whole nine yards. She checks her phone, probably texting Ben to let him know she's arrived. I grip the steering wheel, my knuckles white. I give her a few minutes, then step out of the car. The cool night air sharpens my focus. I walk towards the hotel, my pulse steady, my mind clear. This is it. Inside, I head straight to the front desk. The clerk barely looks up as I approach. I'm here to meet someone, I say, my voice calm. Emily Waters, room 712. She's expecting me. The clerk glances at the screen, then nods. Go right up. I ride the elevator in silence, my reflection staring back at me in the polished metal doors. I feel the weight of what I'm about to do, but there's no turning back now. I've come too far. The elevator dings, and I step out onto the seventh floor. The hallway is quiet, carpeted in a rich burgundy. I walk slowly, deliberately, towards room 712. I stop in front of the door, listening. Muffled voices. Laughter. I take a deep breath, then knock. There's a pause, then footsteps. The door opens, and there she is, Emily, her smile fading the moment she sees me. Her face pales, her eyes wide with shock. WH what are you doing here, she stammers, trying to hide her panic. I push past her into the room. Ben is standing by the bed, his shirt half-buttoned, his expression confused, then alarmed. He looks between me and Emily, his mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water. Is this him? I say, my voice low, deadly. This is who you've been sneaking off with. Emily steps forward, her voice trembling. It's not what you think, please, I can explain. No, I cut her off, my voice cold. You've lied enough. I don't need your explanations. Ben starts to speak, but I turn on him my eyes blazing. And you? What kind of man sleeps with another man's wife? Ben's face drains of color. I didn't know, man, I swear. Spare me, I hiss, stepping closer to him. I've got everything. The texts, the photos. You didn't just make a mistake. You made a choice. Ben backs away, his hands up in a weak defense. I want to rip him apart, to make him pay for everything he's taken from me. But he's not worth it. This isn't about him. I turn back to Emily, who's standing there, tears streaming down her face. Please, don't do this, she whispers, her voice broken. We can fix this, we can. I pull out the envelope from my coat and toss it onto the bed. There's no fixing this, Emily. That's everything you need to know. Divorce papers. 
The evidence. You're done. She looks at the envelope, her hands trembling, then back at me, her eyes wide with fear. You can't. I already have, I say, my voice hard as steel. I've taken care of everything. The house, the accounts. You get nothing. You don't deserve any of it. She breaks down, falling to her knees, sobbing. I feel nothing, no pity, no regret. Just cold satisfaction. I turn and walk towards the door, pausing for a moment to look back at her one last time. You made your choice, Emily. Now live with it. Without another word, I leave, closing the door behind me. As I step out into the cool night air, I feel the weight lifting from my chest. It's over. The lies, the deceit, the betrayal, it's all behind me now. I've torn her life apart, just like she tore mine. There's no going back, no second chances. I'll never see her again, and that's exactly how I want it. This chapter is closed. The end of us, forever.